This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. At luncheon on October the 3rd, the RCMI Museum hosted guest speaker, former CTV producer Larry Rose, who spoke to the topic, Seven Famous Photographs of World War II. With his concept of what the visuals would have been for Lloyd Robertson if Lloyd Robertson had been doing the daily TV news uh, during the Second World War. Um, so um, I guess we'll fasten our seat belts and please join me in uh, welcoming Larry to the podium. Well, thanks very much for coming here today. I, I really appreciate it. I know at this time of year there are many demands on your time. We're in the middle of an election. We're in the middle of a whole bunch of other things. So the fact that you take some time out for a talk like this is uh, very, very much appreciated. Thanks to uh, Bill Hines and the Museum Committee for organizing this. There's a lot more work that goes into it than is really obvious. So uh, I'm most grateful for that. Also, we have a number of artifacts over here that Ryan has put together, and I'm actually going to refer to one of them in a minute. So if, if you get a chance afterwards, please have a look. I would, so um, uh, a very quick story about that, uh, the person who wore that hat. Um, this is not in my prepared remarks, but since I saw it here, I'll try and make it really brief. Um, that hat belonged to Major General Chris Vokes, V O K E. Yes, Chris Vokes. Uh, he is the only officer I ever heard of who was promoted to Lieutenant General by mistake. Uh, and what happened is this. Uh, it's a long story. I'll try and collapse it. He was one of the divisional commanders in Italy when General Burns was sacked. And so the question was, who is going to be the Canadian uh, Corps commander in Italy? Uh, Volks was a divisional commander, and General Hofmeister was another one. So, you know, the chances are it was going to be one or the other of those, and Hofmeister was new. So anyway, a message came in to the signals uh, headquarters there, and there were British, two British signalmen were on the, um, on the desk, received the message. And the message said, C. Volks promoted L. Gen, right? C. Vogue's permitted L. Gen, uh, promoted L. Gen. So the signalman, uh, it was spelled with an F. It was F O K E S. And uh, the signalman didn't know of any general folks with an F, but they knew general Vogue's with a V. So they changed the F to a V and put the message through. And so Vogue's got this message with great delight. Finally, he's getting the recognition he deserves. He's being promoted Lieutenant General. And he puts up his badges and starts taking control. About a week later, uh, another officer arrived, a Lieutenant General, newly promoted. And his name was Folks, F-O-U-L-K-E-S, Charles Folks. And Folks had been the one who was promoted. And Volks, with, his, with great embarrassment, had to um, take down his rank and realize that he'd been promoted by these two signalmen by mistake. <laughs> so there's his hat right there. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes or so. I have seven images I'm going to show you, and then of course there are other ones around it, and then I welcome questions or comments. And it's a work in progress, so if you have some ideas, I'd be really interested to, uh, to hear. I'd also be interested to, to hear how many of these images you actually recognize, because some of them are maybe not famous, but they're important or they're significant. So there may be a couple here that you don't know. So these are the uh, famous images and the stories behind them. So here's the first picture, and this is the one that I used in the flyer, so I think you'll all recognize this. It's called Wait For Me Daddy. And uh, the picture was taken on October 1st, 1940. 
The troops are marching down 8th Street in U.S. Minster. We have someone from Vancouver here today. You know where New Westminster is in the BC Lower Mainland. The members are regiment are the, the soldiers are members of the British Columbia Regiment on their way to be loaded aboard a coastal ferry boat, the Princess Joan. And they're going to a secret destination. Now the, the picture sort of implies that they're going overseas, right? That's sort of what you get from this picture, right? Is off to war. They're on their way to Europe. But there's something that doesn't quite add up, because if they're on their way to Europe, they would be going by train, right? They would be getting on trains and going to Halifax. No, they're getting on boats. They were on their way to Nanaimo, a training area on Vancouver Island, where they trained for two weeks. And then they came back. And then a few weeks later, they went back again. And then they came back, and it was two years later before they actually went overseas. So the, uh, the picture is a little bit... Uh, uh, a little bit uh, misleading. So, uh, it's called Wait For Me Daddy. Uh, here's a better uh, picture of the little boy. Um, his name is Warren Whitey Bernard. Whitey was his nickname. We'll skip over that in these more sensitive times. We'll just call him Warren. And uh, he's reaching out to his dad, Rifleman Jack Bernard, and his mother Bernice is there on the left. Uh, I'll mention right now that Jack Bernard, of course, the regiment later changed to Armored Corps and went overseas, and um, he came back as a sergeant, and he survived the war. This picture was reproduced in Life Magazine, Time, Newsweek, Liberty, Reader's Digest, and literally thousands of newspapers. It was widely used for war bond drives, and after he became famous, they kind of dragooned the little uh, war on here into appearing at war bonds. And he would say, coach, of course, would say, please buy war bonds so my daddy can come home. How's that? Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> the famous picture has been turned into all kinds of things. We have some of the Canada Post here. It's been a postage stamp. It's been a coin. And on the right-hand side there, on the left-hand side, uh, is... Um, it's been turned into a sculpture, which is just around the corner. Oh, I forgot Malcolm's from Vancouver, too. It's just, uh, just around the corner from where the picture took place. So it's, it's, uh, it's really one of the incredibly famous pictures of the Second World War. Sorry. Um, all right, here's the photographer, Claude Detloff. And there's the Vancouver Daily Province, Wednesday, October 2nd, 1940. Um, the, head, the, the cut line on the photograph doesn't say, wait for me, daddy, but that's what Dedloff said, um, Warren Bernard said. So it's become known by that name. Um, I have two small personal uh, attachments to this uh, picture, wait for me, daddy. Um, first of all, I was a member of the British Columbia Regiment in the 1970s. And second, I covered Dedloff's funeral for CBC News. Uh, I remember one day when I was working as a reporter in Vancouver, somebody said, Claude Detloff died. Who's Claude Detloff? Well, wait for me, Daddy. Well, I'd never heard of the picture. But anyway, I went to the funeral, and it was very touching, and uh, he was very much a revered figure in Vancouver. There's a close-up again. So here is Warren Whitey Bernard. Whatever became of him when he grew up? So brace yourself. <laughs> that is him about four or five years ago. Um, he, uh, he moved, mostly he's lived his life in Tofino on Vancouver Island. And at one point he was the mayor of Tofino, which I don't know, has what, a thousand people or 1,200 or something. He was an alderman before that and he was an alderman after that. Um, he uh, owned a marina there for most of his time there. He had various businesses, but um, his son apparently runs the business now. He never cashed in on his fame and has been involved in dozens and dozens of fundraising organizations. He's a member of the Legion and he has donated all kinds of time and celebrity into uh, fundraising for veterans. So here's a little uh, clip of him. He's talking. This is the day they unveiled the statue. Seventy-five years ago today, on this spot, 
Vancouver Province photographer Claude Detloff caught me in an act of disobedience <laughs> and framed the now famous wait for me daddy photo. I now find myself, five year old self, enshrined in this magnificent bronze and also back to back with the queen on coin of the realm. On a postage stamp, postcards, envelopes, and some of my personal collection to the do with the photo is now archived uh, across the street uh, by the city. So that's, uh, that's uh, Mr. Bernard, and he sounds like a very well-spoken sort of person. Last picture on this set. Somebody has colorized this picture, and I thought you just might be interested in seeing a colorized version of it. I'm not really a fan of colorized pictures, except maybe those first world war ones. But it does kind of bring it to life a little bit. Okay, wait for me, Daddy. All right, the second picture. This picture is about Major Curry, VC. And by the way, we have two Victoria Cross medals just in this case here, if you wanted to look at them afterwards. Uh, so this is Major Curry. Now, this picture may not be immediately recognizable, but it is one of the most remarkable pictures of the Second World War. And there it is. Uh, this is Major Curry standing there with a pistol on one side, beside the man with the white shirt on. He's, Curry is the one with the pistol. Um, war historian C.P. Stacy has said, this picture is as close as we're likely ever to come to a photograph of a man actually winning the Victoria Cross. The picture was taken at the moment a relief force was able to get to Curry. The date is August 19th, 1944, and the scene is Saint Lambert sur Dive. It's in the middle of the Battle of Falaise. And here is, here's where they were. Saint Lambert is just at the point where the lower red arrow is. That's Saint Lambert. So what was happening is the Canadians are coming down from the north, Americans are coming up from the south, and they have thousands of German troops trapped in this uh, area here on the one side. And the Germans are all trying to get through that little bottleneck, and Curry and about 180 Canadians are the cork in the bottle. The Germans are streaming by them on either side, and they're trying to take Curry out so that they can get some of their vehicles and get through thousands of more troops to escape. So, um, on the evening of August 18th, a small force of Canadians were ordered to close one of the gaps to get in the, to get in the way of those Germans and prevent them from escaping. Um, Major Curry's full name is Major David Vivian Curry. He was in the South Alberta Regiment. He was in command of the force made up of some tanks, anti-aircraft tank, uh, anti-aircraft, anti-tank guns, and infantry. The infantry was from the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. They were completely surrounded. For most of the time, Curry's force controlled about half of Saint Lambert, while the Germans had the other half. Time after time, Curry fought off German attempts to overwhelm his force. Near dusk on the 20th, Curry ordered an attack of his own and captured the village. Now, in the meantime, the Canadians are trying to break through this cordon of Germans to, to get to the relief of these guys, but it took three days. Now, the photographer in this, um, of this picture, and that's him on the uh, one side there, Lieutenant Donald Grant, and he's a member of the photographic service of the Canadian Army. So he took that picture, and there he is with his fabulous speed graphic camera. It was a famous camera in the 40s and 50s. All of, it looks like right out of the front page uh, <laughs> movie, right? Speed graphic. Uh, so this is the moment. Uh, Grant was right with the leading troops who were, who were relieving Curry, and that's the moment he snapped that picture. So it's the very moment the relief force arrived. So. Um, let's see, uh, his small force destroyed seven tanks, 12 pieces of artillery, and 40 vehicles. There were about 800 German casualties, and 2,100 Germans were captured. And some of them were captured while the battle continued, so it was a very dicey, fluid situation. You've got some, 
some captives over here and some people shooting at you over there and you're having to keep an eye on the captives at the same time you're trying to defeat the other people. So it, the result is one of the most amazing and heroic episodes of the war. Major Curry's conduct and contempt for danger set a magnificent example for all ranks under his command. At one point he used a rifle fired from the crew commander's position of his tank to deal with snipers who'd infiltrated to within 50 yards. The result was the Victoria Cross, the only Canadian VC in the Normandy campaign. So after the war, uh, Curry was uh, a garage mechanic. That's what he'd done before the war. I think he had his own garage, and after the war he went back to being a garage mechanic. Um, very humble person by the sound of it. However, later in the war, he served as sergeant at arms in the House of Commons between 1960 and 78. He died in 1986 and is buried in Owen Sound. Now, here's how the newsreel sounded. So we don't have Lloyd Robertson, we don't have a uh, big name, but here it is all the same. Still another Canadian has been awarded that most coveted of all decorations, the Victoria Cross. Major David Curry of Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, is the recipient of the honor. Major Curry is a squadron commander of an armored regiment. He is decorated for the outstanding part he played in the saint lambert belfur deeb offensive. This opened the last phase in the drive to close the Falaise Gap. Standing his ground despite fierce counterattacks, he advanced to invest his objective. By this time, every officer of his small force had been killed or wounded. His conduct will forever be an example to the entire Canadian Army. So there were a number of pictures taken there. This is one taken a few minutes later. I don't quite understand the orientation, but I believe the Germans were coming straight down that road, and Curry's force was sort of in a T-shape across the road. Now, um, a couple of years ago, uh, Curry's Victoria Cross medal was put up for sale. He died, and I gather the family was in some sort of financial distress of some kind. A foreign collector bought it, but the Canadian War Museum launched a fundraising campaign and was able to raise enough money to buy the medal, which is now at the War Museum in Ottawa. This is a picture of Curry's three grandchildren viewing the medal when it first went on display. They're Brenda Curry on the left, David Curry, and Sandy Curry. All right, now, number th uh, this is the third picture, and this one I, I warn you, this is a... Uh, uh, shows war at its worst, so just do brace yourself a bit. And this, of course, is Dieppe. This is August 19th, 1942. This is the main beach on Dieppe. The photo was taken by a German army photographer on the afternoon of the raid. I estimate this is probably around 2 or 3 in the afternoon, and the, Canadian, the last Canadian relief ship had only left around 1 o'clock, so this is very soon after the uh, end of the battle. Uh, the Germans tried to uh, make this into a huge propaganda victory, and so they had a, f a whole bunch of photos, and I think we've all seen photos of Dieppe with the surrendering soldiers and so on uh, at various times. Uh, the Germans described it as an attempted invasion. This photograph has been used dozens of times, and I just picked out four books just in a few minutes off the web that have used that picture as uh, cover. You know, it's cropped sometimes, but basically that's it. So what do we know about this picture? Um, there were about 6,000 mostly Canadian troops who landed on uh, Dieppe. The casualties, more than 60% killed, captured, or wounded. It was the worst day ever in Canadian military history. Now, what's in this photograph? In the foreground, you can see an American and a Canadian uh, soldier who, who, who died. Um, we don't know who the Canadian is, but the American, and you can tell him by his gaiters, he's wearing gaiters, and only American had gaiters around their legs. There were 50 U.S. Rangers uh, in the raid. Some of them were on this side of the operation, some on that. Some got back to England, some didn't. And by deduction, they're able to determine that uh, it's believed that the second person here is Ranger Lieutenant Joseph Randall of Washington, D.C. It's a extraordinary that they can actually identify the person. The landing craft burning on the right, and by the way, the photograph is almost, it's almost like a painting, isn't it? You know, if you had, if 
you had Photoshop and you wanted to move anything around, I don't think you'd move anything. It's an incredibly composed picture, you know, with the lines pointing to the center, the depth of field, and so on. It's an astounding picture, just as a photograph or as a piece of art, never mind the horror of the moment. Um, the landing craft is TLC tank landing craft number five, which was hit by very accurate mortar fire the moment it touched down. They had preset the ranges, right? The German mortars and German artillery all had preset their range finders, and so all they had to do is write high tide, turn it to the high tide, and you could start firing immediately. So the crew on that landing craft were all lost. None of them survived. However, it carried, I think, three or four tanks, I'm not sure which, and two of them you can see here. Uh, the tank on the, uh, on the one side, I'm always getting my left and right confused. On the left. <laughs> the tank on the left is a Churchill tank. Uh, there were more than 60 brand new Churchills that were meant to be part of the attack, but only 28 of them were actually launched and two of them sank. About half of them never got off the beach. And we can see from this photograph why they never got off the beach. Look at the tread on the right-hand side. You can see the tread is broken. That's why that tank's not going anywhere, because the tread's broken. You can see it just in front of the sprocket there. And what happened was the tanks came off the uh, landing craft, hit what's called chert. And these are flat stones. It's not pebbles. They're kind of flat stones, about four or five inches long. And it goes down for five feet or six feet. So there's no point in spinning the tank treads trying to get traction. There is no traction. And you can see that that tank is buried partway at the rear there, right? It's already dug in. So the tank was trying to turn and broke a track, and it spent the entire time of the Dieppe raid there. They could fire their gun, but you can see it's pointed up, and they couldn't really get it lowered enough to make much difference. So they had a machine gun, and they fired until they ran out of ammunition. It was too dangerous to get out. They just waited until the battle was over, and they surrendered and went into captivity. I just want to mention briefly, just look at the rear there. You can see the headlands, and the Germans had uh, artillery and other guns right on top of that headland, firing right down and across the beach. They had guns in the, uh, about halfway up, that were also hidden. And part of the plan was to take those guns out before the main beach uh, was hit by uh, landing forces, but it didn't succeed. And so you can see how, how unprotected this beach is. So, who was in that tank? Well, we know one of the first, actually I have the list of who's there, but here's the crew commander. And his name is Lieutenant M.J.A. Lambert. And Lambert is a pretty unhappy camper by the look of it. And the reason he's pretty unhappy is that he's gonna spend the next 33 months as a prisoner of war. Uh, Lambert was from Edmonton, after the war, he became a Rhodes Scholar and a lawyer. In 1957, he became the Member of Parliament for Edmonton West. Then in 1962, he became the Honorable Marcel Lambert, Speaker of the House of Commons. When he died in 2000, there were many tributes in the Commons, including Bill Blakey, who said, we see him as a symbol of a generation of young men who were in the military service at the beginning of the war and who therefore suffered in ways that not everyone did by being in places like Hong Kong and Dieppe. Picture number four. And here it is. War posters, and this is maybe the most famous of the war posters. There's, I'll show you some more in just a minute. But um, they were a key part of the government's campaign to build support for the war, and they were used to recruit, to encourage wartime productivity, and to raise money in victory bonds. So they put them up in schools, in the post office buildings, in public buildings, and, and uh, rallies, and so on. So they were very widely used. They were kind of cheap to produce, so, so there were all kinds of them. Now look at this one. Here he is. If this isn't the youth of Canada personified, I don't know who he is. They wouldn't put a helmet on him because it would get in the way of his, his hair, right? 
Uh, he's, got, he's got his bayonet all fixed. He's shouting. The Union Jack is flapping in the breeze behind him. And he's shouting, let's go Canada. So this is kind of the quintessential young Canadian that they're trying to uh, appeal to. Uh, as I said, there were many, many other posters. And I've just put up three here just to give you some other examples. Uh, some of them are superb art in their own right. Now, the center one troubles me a bit. Actually, the center one, I think it's a cover in a recent book by, um, uh, oh, geez, no, her name just escapes me. Um, anyway, it's a recent book about Jewish Canadians. And she took out the center figure and just put the woman and the soldier in there. And uh, now, the trouble with this thing is that I, I think it kind of underestimates the role of women. Now, the, there's the man at the top. He's got his machine gun, the guy in the middle. He's got his riveting gun or whatever, and she's got her garden hoe. <laughs> well, you know, I think the, the, the contribution of Canadian women in the Second World War was a little bigger than Victory Gardens. So I don't think that uh, this poster has stood up very well, and I'm not sure how well it stood up at the time. Because women, you know, became part of CWAC, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force Women's Division. They did remarkable service in, in uniform and out. Because there was a shortage of men, they worked in munitions factories and aircraft factories and uh, shipyards and so on. They did a fantastic uh, sort of life-changing role in the Second World War. But anyway, this, <laughs> this poster thinks that the garden hoe does it. So who did the uh, poster, uh, Let's Go Canada? Well, there's a little clue. His name's up on the top there. Uh, and his name is Henry Roland Everly. And he was from Montreal. He was only in his early 30s and uh, only died in 1999. Evely was one of the founding members of the Contemporary Art Society of Quebec and remained a respected artist after the war. Uh, he had numerous gallery showings and museum exhibitions and remained a revered teacher after the Second World War. This is one of his paintings after the war. It's called uh, The Fortune Teller. And uh, so it's interesting that some of these war artists were, were they're really fine artists and went on to good careers after the war. Now, I want to show one more thing here, and that is a couple of paintings. I, I haven't really dealt with paintings in my talk here because I think it's, it's, first of all, there are dozens and dozens of really superb ones, and it really requires a, a separate talk to deal with it appropriately. But I didn't want anyone to think that I'd forgotten about it or didn't care about it or whatever. So just uh, symbolically, I put two of the paintings here. And they're, some, they're famous artists who did war paintings. The one on the, uh, on the right is uh, Alex Colville. And uh, it's called Infantry Near Nijmegen, Holland, a wonderful piece of art, just a magnificent piece of art. And Colville, by the way, if you look at the face of the front soldier, Colville put his dad's face on it. That's his dad. Picture on the right is Ortona by Charles Comfort. Picture number five. This is another one of these caught, uh, these action shots, right? Here is a dramatic moment as a Canadian Corvette captures uh, a U-boat. This remarkable picture was taken on March 6th, 1944. A boarding party from the Corvette HMCS Chilliwack has come alongside the U-744 at the climax of a hunt that began the day before. The hunt lasted 32 hours. They kept this U-boat underwater for 32 hours, by which time I would think they're almost out of oxygen. And meantime, there are dozens and dozens of, of uh, hedgehogs and uh, other explosives landing all around the boat. Finally, it was driven to the... Uh, it was driven to the surface. It was a classic late war anti-submarine operation with a large group of warships holding deep contact with the sub and pounding it relentlessly until there was no other choice than to surface. So the sub surfaced and the, uh, the Corvette had a, a boarding party ready, ready to go. They were all ready in the boat. Just a matter of uh, lowering them down and sending them over. So what they're trying to do is go down the conning tower and get the secret code books and try and take the boat under tow, turn the seacocks off so they could actually capture the submarine. And um, to discourage the crew from trying to fire that anti-aircraft gun on the, 
on the stern there, you can see holes in the conning tower. So this is the main gun of Chilliwack and perhaps other uh, ships that are firing at that conning tower to make sure the crew doesn't get to the, uh, the anti-aircraft gun. Oh, sorry, went too far. Um, I've lightened up the picture so you can see it a bit better. It's a bit dark, but you can see there's actually a person standing in front of the conning tower. Then there's, I count, five in the boat and one on the deck there. So I don't know if they were able to get the Enigma codes, but they, they towed the U-boat for a while, um, and, um, but it eventually sank. Um, there were... Um, there were, I'm trying to remember, uh, 39, 39, 39 Germans were rescued, so they rescued most of the crew. Um, now, uh, a couple things that this points out. How did they find this U-boat? And the answer is two ways. Uh, well, maybe three. At this point, they were using ultra-long-range aircraft that covered the entire Atlantic, which was a, really, a real game-changer. There was no point in the Atlantic that a U-boat could be on the surface because of aircraft being there. So that was one thing. Second was the ultra signals or ultra intelligence was decoding the location. Each submarine had to send off its location every day. We're at you know, latitude, longitude, blah, blah, blah. It was sent back to the U-boat commanders and that was intercepted and decoded. So the forces like Chilliwack had a pretty good idea where the thing was but also on board was another technological device that we don't think of often enough in winning the U-boat war. And that is called Huff Duff, H-F-D-F, -F, uh, High Frequency Direction Finding. And this was a device that used uh, range finding to locate an object, right? So they, they had a pretty good idea where the sub was when it sent its signal uh, from the Huff Duff equipment from Ultra and perhaps being spotted from aircraft. So by the end of the war, 60% of U-boat crews were dead. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, this attack is sort of an example of how, how dangerous it was to be in a U-boat late in the war. There's Chilliwack, it's a late uh, Corvette. You can see the early Corvettes had the mast in front of the bridge. It's a, a greater shear on the bow and they filled in the side there so there's uh, the folks along the side just above K131 there is all filled in, whereas in the early Corvettes that was not. So this is the late Corvette. So that's that. Okay, number six, the Ruhr Express. Um, this is, of course, a Lancaster bomber, but it's not any general Lancaster bomber. It's a very particular Lancaster bomber. It was called the Ruhr Express. The date is August 6, 1943, and the picture was taken at Malton Aircraft, Victory Aircraft at Malta, which is Toronto Airport, right? That's where this thing was built. Uh, it later became AV Row, and that's where the CF-105 was built. It uh, later became Bombardier, and I think just in the last few weeks, it's now Mitsubishi, right? Owns that plant. But this was the first, um, this was the first Lancaster bomber produced in Canada during the Second World War and the occasion, all the people were around there because they're all the workers at the plants and they had a little, they had a little um, celebration there to mark the uh, occasion of the first roll-up. Now the thing about it is this, uh, the popular belief was that after the ceremony the plane would immediately take off for Britain where it would be set to do battle with the enemy and an ad in the Globe and Mail confident, uh, confidently declared that this battleship of the air, love that, uh, would be heading east in a week or two, would be in action. wrong -o. In fact, production had fallen so far behind schedule, it was becoming a scandal. So they rolled this thing out long before it was really ready. Uh, they put a crew aboard it, uh, with the captain being Reg Lane of Victoria, who was a famous Lancaster pilot, uh, and the, the crowd dispersed. They got into the, uh, the aircraft with their pet poodle, whose name I have here somewhere, but I've lost, uh, Bambi, and the crew uh, uh, started to rev up the engines. But they knew that, first of all, there were no gauges for any of the uh, engines, and half the instruments were missing. 
this plane wasn't going very far. <laughs> so they did fly it anyway, and they flew it to Dorval, Quebec. And the moment it landed, they whizzed it into a hangar where they had to spend a month finishing off this aircraft. So it didn't have any proper instrumentation. It was a really good, kind of a dodgy business to fly it at all. So whatever became of the Ruhr Express? Well, um, the plane flew, it did, it did eventually get to Europe. It flew in number 405 squadron RCAF and later 419 squadron. It took part in 49 missions. However, on January 2nd, 1945, the aircraft experienced hydraulic problems while attempting a landing. The flaps wouldn't deploy properly, the plane overshot the runway, ended up in a farmer's field where it crashed into a trench digger. The crew escaped amid exploding ammunition, but that was the end of the Ruhr Express. There's Rachel and the crew, and here's the little bit Lancaster. This is the one in Hamilton. And the, uh, the Lancaster was amazing for a whole bunch of reasons. It carried twice the bomb load of a B-17, the crew liked it because it was very, uh, it was well built. It could take a lot of damage before it would crash. And it would fly at 2,000 feet higher than some of the other uh, contemporary aircraft. So it was a little bit safer flying a Lancaster than other planes. So this is one of two Lancasters still flying today. It's the one based at, uh, at Hamilton. Okay. All right, now this is the last one. Um, now, a lot of people will not think of this as a Canadian picture, but it is. This is a Canadian picture, and here it is. <laughs> now, why is it a Canadian picture? Well, this photo of Sir Winston Churchill was taken on December 30th, 1941, in the chamber of the Speaker of the House of Commons after Churchill had delivered his famous some chicken, some neck speech. That was one, you know, the French general that said after the defeat of France, Britain would have its neck wrung like a chicken in two weeks. Well, the Battle of Britain proved that didn't happen and so in his speech to the Commons, Churchill said, well, some chicken, and it got a big round of applause and laughed, some neck, and it kind of brought down the house. So that was, this was right after that. According to The Economist magazine, this is the most reproduced portrait in the history of photography. And it's been described as one of the most iconic portraits ever shot. What makes it remarkable is the defiant look in Churchill's face. It's the expression on his face that, that means everything. It was a synonym for Britain's stand against fascism. Uh, now, the picture was arranged by Prime Minister King, and Churchill didn't know about it. So he was ushered into the Speaker's chamber, and... Um, and he was a bit taken aback. By the way, Karsh took other pictures. I want to show you one here. See, here's another picture. There were three or four pictures taken that day, but we don't see this one because it just doesn't have the same impact, right? It doesn't have that kind of bulldog thing. It's just a nice picture of Churchill. You know, we've seen 50 of them. And that's Karsh there on the left. So here's Karsh describing the moment where Churchill came into the, came into the chambers and he had a big cigar in his mouth. And he didn't want to take the cigar out. So Karsh was in kind of a pickle. So evidently, he was not prepared to be photographed. He had a cigar in his mouth. I managed to disarm him of the cigar, but ever so delicately and so respectfully. And after the defiant image he gave me, he straightened up. He said, you can take another one. And this is the one we gave him uh, immediately afterward. And what is extraordinary about this photograph, it was a symbol of the determination mm -hmm. and the... The British Bulldog. British Bulldog, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, one of the most famous <laughs> photographs of all time. Um, uh, Carr said after, uh, after the picture was uh, taken, Churchill lit a fresh cigar, puffed at it with a mischievous air. So those are the uh, seven photographs I have. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very, very much for your attention. If you have comments or suggestions, I, I'm happy to have them now. By the way, I have some of my books for sale over here if you want their $25. Any comments, questions, suggestions? Larry, yeah. when that brass uh, or bronze statue went up, 
uh, well, was the background known that they were just going over to the Nile for a couple no, of weeks? No, no, I don't think so. They that said that the, the newspaper accounts said they, they were going to a secret destination. Yeah. So they didn't, it wasn't published where they were going. So I, I don't know when it came out. I mean, when the guys came back, I think that, <laughs> that, would, have, that would have been a tip off. But, <laughs> but it is, it's, it's misleading, isn't it? You think, oh, geez, there they go off to yeah. work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.